rights. You got a right to be here. You got a right to fight. Access, access, no sacrifice. We're here and we're gonna stay. Good morning. Welcome to Adaptive Chicago Productions. I am your host, Kenny Borst. Today we are discussing the topic of service and companion dogs for children with disabilities and uh, the participation of families of children with disabilities. To discuss this topic here is our guest, Jack. Welcome to the show, Jack. Hello, thank you for having me. Could you um, outline for us the difference between a service dog <coughs> and a companion dog? For our program, when I started in 1998, most of the service dogs went to someone with a physical disability. That meant that the dog helped somebody, usually uh, paraplegic, quadriplegic, some sort of physical disability. And the dogs you saw at that time assisted people with independence. The organization that I started working with was a, a developmental disabilities organization. So a majority of the people and the kids had developmental disabilities, Down syndrome, autism, non-physical disabilities. So it was a little bit awkward at that time because when we did go into the community, most of the public did not realize that an able-bodied child or an adult can still have a service dog. The person may be able-bodied, but a lot of people have hidden disabilities and it would make their outward appearance look like they're able-bodied, but they're really not. And in the last three or four years, we actually found ways that dogs can assist people for disabilities that weren't normally used for service dogs. I mean, we've placed a couple of dogs with uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and they're able to help people. If you saw somebody with a service dog that had PTSD, you would say that they don't have a physical disability, why do they need a service dog? So people in the community and the public don't realize that those dogs do assist people without physical disabilities. What kind of dogs uh, do you use? All of the dogs that we've used, and, and doing this since 1998, and um, trying to get dogs that were of quality, we originally started with one dog, and that was the first and only dog that I paid for. It was mm -hmm. uh, a yellow lab puppy. But most of the dogs since, and even today, we do get a lot of pure breed dogs, uh -huh. but all of the dogs come from rescues, animal shelters, uh, owner give ups. And probably, I would say three quarters of the dogs are labs, lab golden mixes, uh, something in that order. Okay. And probably in the last probably three or four years, we've been doing a lot with uh, the doodles, the golden doodles and oh, lab yes. doodles. Mm -hmm. A lot of the kids with certain disabilities and autism uh, have allergies. So yeah. those dogs, unfortunately, are, are kind of the designer dog of, of the years, but uh, with, with the allergies, they, they are very helpful. How long does it take to train these dogs? It usually is about a year. I mean, it depends on what the dog needs to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we try to avoid getting puppies the, the first year of a puppy's life. It's, it still works. We can do puppies, but usually that first year is mostly assessments, housebreaking, and basic right. training. So I kind of like to get dogs that are older, at least a year old. Mm -hmm. But depending on what the dog has to do, I would guess at least a minimum of a year. That's, that's good. That's very interesting. Um, and... How do you go about doing the training? What phases, how many different phases, and what methodology specifically do you use? In the beginning, it's all about the assessment. And, and okay. I've gone to animal shelters where there's 60, 80 dogs, and we may wow. only choose one or two. Mm -hmm. Almost everything right from the start is choosing the right dog. And that all is basically temperament and their ability to interact with people. Once we make sure that the temperament is okay, because you got to understand that you're talking about kids with special needs. Uh -huh. So, you know, a Down syndrome or an autistic child, we have to make sure that that dog is very appropriate in, in temperament. Whenever the issues of etiquette in uh, the service dog training comes up, uh, what do you tell members of the public about that, about what they should or shouldn't do? Basically, when we do demonstrations and we talk to the public, Every dog that is street certified wears this red vest. Mm -hmm. And on the red vest it says, please do not pet me. If a dog is working like a C&I dog or a service dog, uh -huh. we don't want the people to touch the dog. Good. It distracts from the dog. If a child is walking or an adult is walking and someone in the community goes to pet the dog, it distracts the dog. You make the dog do something it's not supposed to do. We have what we call street certified service dogs 
that are more companion dogs for certain disabilities. So if I put a, a street certified service dog with an autistic child or a Down syndrome child, we want that child as part of their individual treatment plan to socialize with the public. So if you have a child who is working on self-confidence and socialization skills, we want the public to interact with that child. Obviously it's all supervised and we make sure that people will come up and at least ask, can I pet your dog? Right. A Down syndrome child or an autistic child may build a lot of self-confidence by meeting someone in their peer group or people in the community and say, hey, what kind of dog is that? What's your dog's name? And it kind of builds on that person's... It breaks the ice is right. what it does. That's, right. what, that's what a lot of blind people have told me. They say, well, the dog serves as an icebreaker for me. And uh, so, you know, people come up and speak to me that wouldn't otherwise speak to me. But as soon as I say don't pet the dog, automatically it's a turnoff. Yeah, I know some people are offended by that, but they have to understand that the dog is working. And we, we try to do it very structured so that if someone did want to do that, in a mall, we would say, you know, at least they would have the opportunity to ask the child or the adult and say, can I pet the dog? And then that child or that adult would have the opportunity to say, no, the dog is working or mm -hmm. sure, release the dog from its, if it's in a command, a sit or a down, right. that child has the ability to say, okay, and let the dog. How do you go about recruitment for your program? Because I know you have to do a lot of outreach. Right. We do quite a few throughout the Chicagoland area. We do quite a few uh, dog fairs and, and festivals in, in the community. We also do a lot of disability expos. And you got to remember, it, it's hard for a foster family. We have a foster family program. And the oh, foster yes. family program consists of families, mom and dad, maybe the kids, taking a dog into their home, raising it and training it under our guidance. But then there comes a point when they have to give that dog back. Now, it's, it's a good responsibility builder for some of the kids, and yes. you'll see in the clip, we have kids uh, as young as seven up to 13, 14, 15 that actually foster dogs. And it's good responsibility for the kids. They learn about companionship, responsibility, learn, they learn how to train a dog. And then when it comes time to transition that dog into its new owner, that child assists with the new child with a disability. So the foster child and the new service dog recipient can kind of bond together in that transition period. As you know, when you bond with a dog and you live with that dog, you love it, it's you might have heartbreaking it for a year to have to give half. it back. Yes. Right. You, you have to give the dog uh, back. Because I've seen it with the puppy raisers for guide dog, in the guide dog training field. They cry when they have to give them back, and I think that's typical. Um, on the average, how long do the dogs stay in the foster homes? Again, it, it depends on the dog. Uh, it's possible if a dog was going on to be a companion dog, six to eight months, and then uh, the other end of the spectrum could be almost two years. Uh, it depends on each dog. Is it possible you could give us uh, contact information? Do you have a website? Yes, uh, BarkingAngelsServiceDogFoundation.org. They can go to the website and, and contact us through that. Okay. And we do, like I said, we do have many programs. We have the service dogs, the companion dogs, and the foster dog program. And we've also started within the foster dog program, we've allowed some families with a child with a disability to foster a dog, because we have a waiting list. Uh -huh. But if a, a family with a, a disabled child wants to foster a dog, we've opened up a new program where that family can foster a dog that they will actually end up getting. Oh. So it kind of cuts down on the waiting list time, yeah. and it also helps on the bonding part so that the dog that you're actually raising and training is bonding with your child, which is the dog that you'll end up keeping. So you say you have a waiting list, and of yes. course that sort of bring, brings, re reduces the length of it because of, with the foster dog program. But generally speaking, um, I know you can't give specifics necessarily, but uh, right now as we speak, how long is your waiting list? Well, the thing about the waiting list is it's not done on a a first come first serve basis it's not seniority that's good what we've done is if a dog let's say we have a dog that is excellent with retrieving uh, it's been trained to work with the wheelchair it would be a real waste to give that dog to someone with a disability like autism or downs that dog was trained specifically for someone with a wheelchair that's right because so each we, person right. is, has different needs right so if that dog has the skills that that person needs then we go to choose the best match rather than based on seniority. 
Uh, do you have a retirement policy on your dogs, and if so, what is it? Again, it's very difficult. Uh, we try to do each dog on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. uh, Linus could have stayed with his, his family. Uh, they decided to, to give him back to me. We try to keep all of the dogs within the program and try to decide what's best for the dog. We like to keep every dog in their family. So if, if a family had a dog for, let's say, eight to 10 years, we're not gonna pull that dog out of their home. Oh, good. If they're working on a second dog, as long as they're able to handle two dogs and the dogs get along, we have no problem with keeping the dog where it grew up. Oh, that's very impressive. Linus was a special case. He, he came back to me and he's actually a bracing dog. Mm -hmm. He was with an adult who had uh, MS. Uh -huh. So that dog has to learn bracing and, and Linus can, to, can demonstrate bracing, picking up a cane, picking up a uh, cell phone, TV remote, those types of things. That's very so, good. So to demonstrate that, I think you have some clips where we can actually see dogs in action. Awesome. This is Jenny and her dog Simba, and Simba is a, is a mixed breed. Jenny uses oxygen all day, and Simba was trained originally to help Jenny be more independent by carrying her oxygen tanks. Now she also was working on speech. Um, she's very soft-spoken, so she also says Simba come, and also uses the hand signal. Now you can see Simba has a, a special backpack, and that backpack was designed to carry those oxygen tanks. And each oxygen tank weighs approximately, I think, three pounds, maybe two and a half to three pounds each. And that enables Jenny to go to school throughout the malls. Uh, she's able to actually walk independently. Originally, when I first met Jenny, um, either parents, mom or dad, or siblings had to carry those oxygen tanks. I'm Janice, and this is my daughter, Jenny and her service dog, Simba. He carries my action tank. He's my best friend, and he's seven years old. He's a yellow lab mix, and we have had him for seven years old. He's got kind of an interesting story. He was raised in the Dwight Women's Correctional Center for his first uh, 12 months of life, and he came out and was placed with Jenny when she was in the seventh grade, and she's a senior in high school now. Um, and he goes to school with her every day and carries her oxygen and goes to dance class and the choir and right now they're in a work training program. He's done math and English and they're set to graduate this spring. Now this young lady's name is Genevieve and the dog she has is actually only five or six months. That's actually a golden doodle and, and we've been using uh, more and more golden doodles because of the, the allergies. But Genevieve also is working on her individual treatment plan, which is, again, speech, eye contact, and she's actually using the hand signal and the speech of calling Fern to her. And you'll see Fern is very happy, but again, Fern is only five months, and that's Genevieve running. But the, the dog, Fern, is only five months, so he's still in training. And you can see he's very happy to get to, to Genevieve. Hi, I am Christine Sevilla, and my daughter is Genevieve, and we uh, attend a service dog club uh, and the training that goes with it every single week, and it's called Barking Angels. Do you want to say hi, Genevieve, and who's your dog? Fern is my special dog. I belong to a service dog club called Barking Angels. We love Jack. Um, he's our trainer, and he has worked with us a lot. Um, he works with both Fern and Genevieve. So it's not just all about the dog, it's about the person working with the dog. And that's one of the special things about this particular foundation and this club. I can't say enough about what it means to my daughter and what it's done for her in terms of her language and her um, sense of independence and um, her, her um, sequencing. Um, there's a lot of good things that come out of it. So we're just crazy about being able to participate in something like this. Uh, this, this young man's name is John, and his dog's name is Clifford. Now, Clifford, again, was a dog that was rescued from an animal shelter. 
Oh. Now, now this is John using the hand signal to call Clifford, and now Clifford is going to stand on all fours and allow John to use him as a brace to help him get up. And John will also use Clifford for walking if he was going up and down stairs, a curb. Uh, Clifford is solid enough to hold to hold John up if he did become wobbly or, or start to fall. Hi, I'm John, and this is Clifford. He he braces for me, so if I fall down on the ground, I could use him to get up. And he retrieves stuff for me, like um, whatever I drop, my shoes in my book bag, whatever I drop, he'll pick it up for me. What else does he do? The seizure alert back? He's a seizure alert dog. He alerts in my seizures and whatnot. Um, it's basically what Clifford does. He's your constant companion, huh? Yep. And he waits for me to get home. Yeah. <laughs> now this young man, I believe this, let's see, this is Lucas, and Lucas is only seven. And his mom, Leanne, and Lucas are actually foster families. And the foster family program uh, allows a dog to live with a family and that family raises and trains this dog. Now this dog's name is Chewy. He's also a, a, a golden doodle, and mm. he was an owner give up. So as you can see, Lucas at seven is learning how to train dogs, be responsible. That, that's him giving him his treat, which is actually a tennis ball. But the family becomes involved. You have young people helping, helping to train a dog and then actually give that dog back. Now when the dog comes back and gets matched up with a disabled child, that allows Lucas and Chewy to work together with the new family. So it allows kids to bond together and they also help with the transition. That's good, that's really okay. good. This is actually uh, Lucas's mom, this is Leanne. She's a part of our program, she's the president of our program and she is actually training um, let's see who that, that is actually Spirit, that's a black German Shepherd. Was it hard to give up the dog after you trained him? Yes. Yeah. We get attached. It's hard to let him go, but it's nice getting one to move on so we can take on a new one. And now this young lady, this is a, a unique dog also. Uh, Ari is the young lady with her dog Levi. And she's another young person who has uh, one of those hidden disabilities. She is not physically disabled. But Levi has been with her for, I, I think, over a year. And they bonded very well together. They worked very well. They actually went to, to high school together. So Levi was with Ari every day. Wow. And Ari is demonstrating Levi not only being uh, a dog for a hidden disability, but is also able to pick up things. I believe he's picking up uh, an inhaler. So he's learned a few extra skills. And, and Levi is also another dog that was abandoned. When we found Levi, he was in a, a college dorm, I believe, or an apartment uh, about three, four years ago. Hi, I'm Jack, and this young lady's name is Ari, and her service dog's name is Levi. You want to tell what Levi does for you? Uh, this is Levi, and he is with me for post-traumatic stress disorder, and he helps me in everyday activities like being out in huge crowds and stuff so that I don't get too anxious. Now, now this young lady, this is Abby, and Abby is a, a foster, and she's fostered two or three dogs. She actually assisted with the training of Clifford. Wow. So this, this young lady, Abby, is assisting on training this dog, which... This is a shelter dog. This dog, Nessie, came from the Animal Welfare League. Mm -hmm. This is a, a Mastiff mix of some sort. And this dog, Nessie, is actually being trained as Simba's replacement. Now, you remember Simba was the dog that carries the oxygen? Yes. We are starting to work with Nessie because we believe Simba may, may retire within the next year. So Abby is helping to train Nessie to, to carry oxygen tanks. So we're kind of preparing ahead of time. Oh, that's wonderful. I think that's, that's, uh, that's good. You can never be too prepared. Right. Well, that's sort of uh, the plan. We, we hope to follow the plan, but you can never tell. Mm -hmm. This young lady is Carly with her service dog, Buster. 
Now this is a situation where Buster is street certified, but Carly does not take Buster to school every day. He's not needed in school. If Carly needed to, she can take Buster out into the community, but uh, is not actually needed for, for school. Okay. And you'll see Carly, Carly is doing a hand signal and verbal command. And, and Buster is another dog that was uh, a shelter dog. I'm Kurt Williston. I'm the father of Carly and Abby. Carly, who are you? Hi, Red then. And who's this? Oh, why my silver dog. Can you look at the camera? Yeah. Silver dog. Service dog. Is he a good boy? Mm-hmm. How long have you had him? Four years. Four years? Mm -hmm. That long? And this is Abby. And I foster service dogs, and as he's my fifth dog. How many? Fifth. Fifth dog. What does Buster do for you, Carly? He holds my diabetes bag around. He, he carries your diabetes bag around? Does he keep you out of traffic? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Does he, does he keep you company at home, too? Yep. Does he go for walks with you? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Abby, what are you training uh, Nessie for right now? She's going to carry oxygen tanks for a girl. Very nice. And what other, what other things have you taught other dogs? Um, one dog braces for his, his owner. Um, and another dog goes with a boy in a wheelchair. This, this is John and Clifford, and Clifford is demonstrating opening up a door. If you notice at some of the stores, um, Walgreens, Target, Dominic's, uh, some of the, the college campuses, they have an electronic door. Yes. So the dog can actually jump up, touch the plate, and that'll open up the door. So oh, that that's was, cool. That was how we trained train for that. And here's Lucas again. Lucas is seven with, with Chewy, and Lucas is demonstrating uh, Chewy touching that plate. And you'll see that that white board that I'm holding is actually uh, a symbol for the wheelchair accessibility, and that would be the plate that you would see at doors. And Chewy touches the plate with his hand or his paw, and that opens up the door. Now this young man's name is Zach, and his dog is a golden retriever named Toby. And what we've done with Toby and Zach, again, the individual treatment plan is Zach has been working on his speech therapy. So we've incorporated Zach with being able to, to say Toby's name. So he's working on speech. And if you notice, he's also using the hand signal to call Toby. So we've been working on that for probably over a year. And it's a slow, long process, but uh, actually Zach's speech has very much improved. So you're, you're, you're watching me give Toby hand signals. So we tried to keep Toby learning speech commands as well as the hand signals so that Zach can do both. When, when Zach says, Toby come or Toby sit, I can be in the background giving him hand signals so that over time, Zach will learn speech commands as well as the hand signals. And that's me giving, giving Toby the hand signal for sit. Now Zach is going to, that's his hand signal for Toby to come. And I don't know if you can hear it, but uh, Zach is also saying, Toby, come. And then he gets a treat. Toby the dog. Hi, this is Becky and her sons, Mitch and Zach. And the dog's name is Toby. So if you could tell us uh, what Toby has done for Zach and your involvement in the program. Uh, the program is wonderful and Toby has given Zach a lot of freedom in life and uh, he can go places and do things and I don't have to sit right on his wheels and keep right up with him. He's, he has a lot of independence with Toby. So it's a great program. <laughs> do you want to say something about Toby? What's his name? Cowboy. Your dog's name is Toby? Yeah. You love Toby? Yeah. You love Toby? yeah. How about me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And this young lady, her name is Emily. And Emily is a, a young person too who is also a foster. And the dog she's training is Minnie. And this also allows kids. Uh, teenagers, young people, to actually help train the dogs. So Emily is fostering many and learns about training. I think she's very involved in 4-H with, with dog training. Wow, okay. And 
Uh, this dog, Minnie, is actually almost to the point of coming back to the program, so, so uh, Emily and Minnie will help with the transition to, to their new person. Uh, this is Sharon and her daughter, Emily, and the dog's name is Minnie. And how long have you been fostering? Uh, we've been fostering almost three years. <laughs> and why do you foster? Um, Emily just wanted to get involved. She has a lot of um, animal training care experience, and we like the organization and the purpose of it, and we wanted to help out, and so that's why we got involved. Emily, why do you foster? What, what do you get out of it? Uh, just to train. Yeah. You have fun? Yes. What about Minnie? Tell us about Minnie. Uh, she's a handful. <laughs> she is? Okay. Are you prepared? How long have you had her? Uh, two and a half years. And you're ready to give her back? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess. The, the dog, Minnie, is going to come back to the program soon, and Emily and Minnie are going to help the new person that Minnie ends up going to. We've actually gone to the movies mm -hmm. with uh, six, seven dogs. Well, see, that's wonderful because not only do you get the dogs the exposure they need, but also, you know, you get out there, so um, it also increases your avenue for advocacy efforts. Right. And it teaches the public. Uh, we've had yes. many instances where we have to tell people, no, you can't touch the dog. We've had security guards or people say, you're not allowed in here. And we say, well, you have to learn about the ADA laws, and, and these dogs are allowed in the That's community. That's right. Absolutely. Well, I guess that's it. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and thank you for being on our show, and, uh, and hope to talk to you in future update shows. Thank you very much. All of the, the kids and the dogs, we, we enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you.